Uh, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, on behalf of uh, the L'Oréal Active Cosmetics and our medical team, uh, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christian Bouchard. I'm uh, the new president of L'Oréal Active Cosmetics in Canada. Uh, to be more specific, we're talking about the following brands, uh, La Roche-Posay, CRV, uh, Vichy, Dermablend Pro, and SkinCeutical. I spent essentially the last uh, 18 years uh, working for L'Oréal and the last three in Paris in charge of international business development for these brands. Uh, with my team, uh, we will be facilitating uh, the talk this evening and we'll uh, be taking uh, your question at the end of, the, of today's presentation. It is with uh, great interest uh, that we are welcoming our guest speaker today on, uh, on a topic that uh, we're really passionate about at L'Oréal Active Cosmetics, uh, the fascinating world of artificial intelligence. Um, in 2018, L'Oréal Advanced Research uh, partnered with uh, BCG uh, to produce a large uh, study called Health 2030 to anticipate the trends of the next uh, 10 years. We knew already that health was more than ever the future of beauty, but the study, had, the study highlighted uh, a strong trend towards consumers and patients' de desire uh, for empowerment uh, to monitor and take care of their own health uh, using AI-powered technologies as a complement to their uh, consultations with healthcare professionals. In parallel, uh, the same year, uh, the L'Oreal Group acquired Modiface, uh, a worldwide leading AI startup specialized in facial recognition, skin diagnosis, and AR. Uh, they're based in Toronto. Uh, since then, we have produced AI-powered uh, algorithms uh, capable of tracking more than 16 clinical signs uh, and helped our consumers to better understand their skin and find solutions tailored to their need. This is obviously just the beginning and uh, the possibilities are endless uh, with the AI universe. Uh, we see the patient journey evolving more and more from offline to online, especially with the growing possibilities offered by teledermatology, for example. While the future of AI remains fascinating, we're excited uh, to introduce our guest speaker uh, to help us explore the topic deeper, uh, Dr. Medrano, uh, a practicing neurologist and researcher for 10 years. Uh, Ignacio was uh, considered by the Spanish specialized media among the most influential people in health healthcare in 2016 and digital health personality of 2018 due to his work promoting systemic changes through information technologies and big data. In 2019, Ignacio was awarded the, uh, the highest Spanish mention for the under 35, the Princess of Girona Award. His bio uh, includes several degrees in healthcare management along with experience uh, as head of strategy at Instituto Ramon uh, Icajal de Invest Investigación Sanitaria in Madrid. After licensing from Singularity University in Silicon Valley in 2014, he founded two artificial intelligence startups, Savannah for reuse, Savannah for reuse of clinical records uh, in research, and Mandelian for diagnosis of genetic diseases. Finally, Ignacio is an international uh, speaker, having helped uh, all the stakeholders in healthcare from the European Commission to to the Spanish government, to hospitals, European scientific societies, and the pharma industry. Uh, Dr. Medrano, thanks for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, your invitation. And I want to go straight to the point. Mm -hmm. So are you users of Google Translate? And I'm sure the answer in the majority of cases is yes. And, and the reason why I'm bringing here and getting away from from healthcare and medicine for a while, and we'll, we'll go back, I promise, is because for me, there is probably, as a neurologist, as a medical doctor, there's probably no better way of explaining what um, this particular case with AI is, uh, which we call machine learning, which is basically um, this tool that is able to translate all the languages in the world when it doesn't know anyone. So think about it. It translates um, every language, but it doesn't know anything about syntaxis, about grammar, and how can that be? Well, the reason it is that is it's basically doing the same that children do, right? It's um, learning by cases, by seeing many examples. And it's uh, if you think about it, it's much more useful, much more practical than going to class, to language class. It works better. 
with children. And, and for me, that's basically what is changing in the world in the, la in, in the last two, um, eight to, se to se seven to eight years. The, the fact that um, until more or less 2012 or 2013, all we had was computers that we, we could program. But the difference is that now somehow we're teaching them. And that means, uh, as I said, learning not by rules, but learning by, by patterns, by, by examples. And it's so much better because learning by rules has a big problem. The problem is that whenever a new case is presented, the machine fails. But if you teach it by seeing cases, uh, uh, what is good is that when the machine has seen 1 million cases of something, it's essentially better than when it has seen only one case. It's like big, a bit like when we're at the hospital in the practice and we apply this, right? The majority of the times we don't apply algorithms, we don't apply rules, we apply what we call intuition, which is in fact pattern recognition, and, and it's very efficient. Um, so as I said, that's changing, uh, but in a way that is, that is interesting because these machines translate, um, are able to give answers that are correct generally speaking, even when they don't really know what they're talking about. So it's a bit like a black box, and there are some considerations to that. Uh, but um, we have to consider that, that point, that sometimes they're going to be right, but they're not going to be able to explain us exactly why things are like the outcome they're, they're bringing us. Um, it's like saying that we have learned um, to, to think about what we know that um, that we know, right? Uh, deterministic, it's like Newton, no risk. So we have the formula, we calculate, we throw the arrow, it works, that's all. And, and sometimes we don't have the complete formula of what is going on in the world, so we have to deduce, we have to infer. And that is what we call probability or statistics. And we say, okay, but 90, 95% of the times, it's going to be like in the uh, part of the nature that I have observed. That's Gauss. And that's uh, the world of I know that I don't know. It's, it's uh, situations in which there is risk, but we have certainty about these risks. It's, for example, what happens in the lottery. Now, what we tend to forget is that there is a third system, which is very different. And this is very counterintuitive, where we don't know that we don't know. Uh, the places in life where there is uncertainty about the risks. And in those situations, what is most logic, what is most rational is to apply intuition. Now, technical name for intuition would be heuristics. And we do that every single day, like in the practice, like learning, le learning our native language when we were children. So it's like, like throwing millions of arrows per second for a computer, learning how to do it properly, not really knowing why, but it works. It's good enough. So um, that's, for me, what is changing. We're now creating these machines that mimic our intuition. And that's what we generally can call artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks. We don't care about the name. Let's, let's not get stuck with the names. Let's, let's just um, stick to the concept. Because um, summarizing is like saying that these machines are ready to absorb a set of already solved problems so that by themselves, this is the key, like humans, they can infer the rules and then, and of course, there's always mathematics behind, so it's, this is not magic, as you can imagine, but it's the way we, they do it, so that afterwards, they can anticipate new problems, that's the key, even when it's the first time they're seeing it. Now, um, no surprise that if that's possible, if we're now doing that since 2012, 2013, was when these technologies started to appear in, in Silicon Valley, in Boston, maybe in Tel Aviv, maybe in London, um, it's no surprise that this is getting into institutions and, and, and industries very fast. And, and there are many examples. I don't want to bore you with every, every single case of machine learning, but if by chance we open the newspapers today, I'm sure there will be a new case of, um, of one of these systems that I'm going to start calling machine learning from now on uh, that are basically outperforming humans at different uh, situations. But if we take... Uh, one or two, for example, Amazon would be a nice one because uh, uh, at the beginning, I mean, Amazon wasn't wasn't Walmart. They were not the best at retail, but they had so much data. They were able to build this machine learning system that was able to predict who and how and when was was going to purchase something, and that's how they become uh, pretty much number one company in the world. And and then Netflix would be another nice example. So they were they were not the Columbia or the Universal. They were not the best filmmakers in the world. But they had so much data that they said, look, I built a machine learning system with my data scientists. And I'll tell you something. I don't really know what I'm talking about. I just see vectors. I just see variables in a space. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that 10 episodes, two women, a murderer, it's going to work. 
but don't ask me why. But it works, and they become number one field makers in the world, and so on. So this applies to football, to politics, to, to fashion, to every industry. It's happening that now basically um, every, every institution, every industry is somehow being disrupted by, by this kind of technology that is able to provide answers uh, more or less in a way a human would do, applying intuition. The only difference is that this is a mathematical intuition, so to say. Um, but something that probably you won't see elsewhere, and for me is important, is that basically these machines can do two things, which are uh, on the left side, more classifying, so classifying better than our human mind would do. And then on the right side, uh, doing the same, but considering the timeline, so forecasting what is going to happen, um, which we can call prediction, if you like. But uh, that differentiation with the timeline, for me, is key. And the reason is that whatever happens on the right side of, of the screen is much more impactful and much more interesting. Being able to anticipate in the timeline what is going to happen is going to have much more impact across, across industries. Now, in 2014, I, I was one of the European doctors that started to fantasize about the idea that, that this could get to healthcare. And I don't need to tell you my whole um, you know, entrepreneur journey about how difficult it was to convince the, my, my, my colleagues in the cafeteria. But um, long story short, in, in December 2016, this discussion ended pretty much when um, we saw this publication in JAMA where Google DeepMind in the UK, they were able to... Um, diagnose diabetic retinopathy with, with um, machine learning better than ophthalmologists. And things kept moving on, as you probably have read and known, um, and the FDA in 2018 approved this uh, so that it's, it's today it's in, in, in clinical practice, it's actually working. Now, what it's not so commonly known is that this same group, they kept working. And in the second semester of 2018, they came up um, with this question. They said, look, um, you, ophthalmologists, you, neurologists, you have seen many fundoscopies, you see, have seen many retinas, you have seen many vessels there in the eye. So what's the chance that you tell me that's a woman or a man? And if you ask me, as a neurologist, I've seen many of this, I, I would say, look, this is impossible. I mean, there's no sexual dimorphism in the retina. And, and so they tried and they gave, it to, um, they gave it to a machine learning system and it was able to, to classify correctly in 97% of the occasions. And fair enough, that's clinically not very relevant because there are easier ways to know the gender of someone. But um, it turns out that, that they did the same with uh, predicting cardiovascular risk by looking at the retina. And, and please think about this. Even when in the whole history of medical literature, scientific literature, there's, there's no one single mention to the fact that in the eye, in the retina of someone, you're going to guess, you're going to find the cardiovascular risk, this machine learning system could do it. And they published this on Nature. And that day, I started realizing about how incredibly impactful this was going to be for medicine, because um, how many other correlations are going, uh, are going to be found by, uh, by, by these machines? How many, you know, horizontally, how many biomarkers they're going to put in correlation or association, at least, that our mind wouldn't be able to do. So ultimately, it's all about that, right? It's about seeing correlations wherever our human mind cannot, cannot do it. And, and the reason why this is important is probably because, again, we have cases like on the left where what, where, what these machines are going to be able to do is, is classifying and other cases in which they will consider the timeline. And what am I trying to say here? Well, the, the, what I'm trying to um, communicate is that in fact, in, when you apply these things to healthcare, to medicine, uh, the, these machines, they're going to be able to diagnose, and that's okay. That's, I mean, some people will like that. I'm not dismissing it. I'm not saying it's not relevant, that, that they're not fantastic projects there. But from my point of view, this is in the, under the interest of maybe insurers or providers, I mean, managers of hospitals. But if you ask me as a clinician, what I, I, I find truly impactful and it's not so, so often um, noted in the media and stuff, is what you find below, like on the right side on the screen. The fact that these machines are also be able to score the risk. And you may say, but uh, we're already scoring the risk. We, we've been doing that for 30 years. And, and the answer is, of course, 
That's why, that's why this is important. The difference is that before we as humans selected the variables with which we built those risk scores. And that's why they didn't work very well. But now if we do it with these systems that don't use regression, logistic regression, this is not SPSS, but a machine is finding the correlations, even when we consider them not to be relevant, but maybe they are, if this is the case, then it's so much more likely that they um, make it right. And, and this is what ultimately takes us to the concept of predictive and precision medicine, individualized medicine, personalized medicine. So everything we've been talking about for the last 10 years and that we didn't really touch, in the end, it's, it's not much more than, than the landing of AI on medical data, if we, if we think about it. So no surprise that the FDA has approved I think it's 37 today um, cases of AI outperforming humans across different medical activities in prognosis, diagnosis, and, and, and therapeutics. So it, it's happening. Um, it, it's not fiction anymore. You probably know this. But, um, but what is next? Well, when you look at the amount of papers that we're getting, I would say that we're getting between one and two impactful papers in predictive medicine thanks to machine learning every day. And, and um, it's important to um, um, consider that it's not only um, algorithms that are created through images, but other data layers can be um, in place. Like for example, this one down here, they, are, they published this in Nature last year and they were able to, to um, anticipate which antibiotic was going to work better than the best antibiogram. And the same applies to you know, Crohn's disease remission depending on drugs and chemotherapies and, and so many other data layers that are going to be feeding these machine learning systems, so to say. Um, so maybe you're wondering uh, if this is the case, if this is advancing so fast, much more than we would think, because just two years ago, we had nothing. And now it, it looks like it's really exploding. Did it help at all with, with uh, the coronavirus? Well, um, I think it did partially, uh, not really very much in terms of um, epidemiological vigilance. Fair enough, um, blue Dot and Microbiota were impressive companies that were able, by looking at public data, they were able to predict which countries would be the most affected uh, up front, and that was remarkable, but it didn't really have an influence. Um, I would consider and uh, somehow the case of AI used for differentiating the uh, CT scans and, the, and images in general uh, to, to differentiate when the pneumonia was from COVID origin and when it, it wasn't, and that's in use mainly in the Eastern countries. So that's a remarkable case of AI in practice in COVID. It's, it's also been used for, for tracking the genome of, of, the, of the virus. And maybe this case in Israel has also been remarkable where they are able to, to put a red flag in the cases, in the patients that in case they get the disease, it's gonna be severe. And they did that with a pure machine learning approach. And the same applies to some other algorithms are going are being developed to predict which patients, if they get into the intensive care unit, are going to be most severe, and so on and so on. So it, it's really starting to help, I would say. Um, now, in dermatology, I don't need to tell you that it's it's been uh, one of the cases where it's it, it's been remarkable what this machine learning systems looking at images have been able to do. Um, and there are several publications that are already repeating this, it, it comes from already a few years ago. Um, but it's it, again, it, it's probably not that much about classifying, which is, again, it's already a nice use case, but it's probably as clinicians, it, it, and it doesn't get so much attention. But for me, it's much more relevant to think that these things, these machines are going to be able to predict, for example, which patients are going to uh, respond to epilimumab in malignant melanoma, which I don't know what it, what it is, but it, it, it gives you an idea that it, this is also, uh, can also be applied to your specialty, both in the classification and in the forecasting um, manner, so to say. Um, and of course, uh, there are other applications which are beyond skin cancer. I mean, um, you, you can find publications in, in that regard. So let's say that I am a medical doctor, but I'm also a researcher and I want to do this. I want to be, a, 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 I want to create these algorithms, not just use them because it, it seems quite clear that we're going to be, we're going to be using them. But what about if I want to 
to participate act actively. Where probably you have to look at the data layers yeah, because this person, the data scientist, who is the person that, that builds these algorithms for you and you're gonna find them in companies, in universities, um, is going to ask you uh, basically for, for two things. He's gonna say, what is your clinical question? You, you may have one. And then he's gonna say, he or she is, is going to say, and, and what is your the data you give me to fit my, my system? So I'm sure images we have, images that are all around in medicine, and this field is advancing so fast. So if you look at this, people on the left side, and just to give you an example about where the in tech industry is, they are, they're fake faces. They don't exist. These humans never existed. They're generated artificially by a, by a neural network, and they are generally used for... Um, generating fake Twitter profiles to cheat us. And, and this is the kind of technology that is arriving. So this same subtype of AI, which name we don't need to mention today, is the same one that we're already applying to microbiological tests powered by AI or for mammographies, which is where, where it's a, a very obvious case that it's also applicable to, to dermatology, even when I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Um, so no surprise that for the Lancet in, 20, in 2019, the big advance of the year was that uh, machines were matching humans in image-based diagnosis. So images is going to be there for sure. It's probably the one that is most advanced. And there are so many remarkable mm, cases like you know this one. Sometimes we get lost in the papers, but an application is the best way to explain it. So if you look at this case, they're able to... Um, to get, feed the machine with the nails and also the hemoglobin, and it's able to predict which the hemoglobin is going to be. Uh, just for us not to forget that this is about machines seeing correlations wherever we don't see them. Sometimes it will be counterintuitive. Sometimes it will be uncomfortable. It will, it will be our job to say if that contextually and clinically makes sense or not, because these machines uh, cannot think contextually or contrafactually. So they will need our, our guide and experience and human thinking. Um, now, another data layer that usually gets um, forgotten um, because we concentrate on images because it's more advanced is sensors, right? So what happens when the, when the patient goes home or in the car or uh, at work? Uh, we lose a lot of information. That's why the whole tech industry is somehow trying to um, give us many sensors so that we can keep feeding those black boxes, those algorithms. And I don't see far, uh, very far this situation where we're, we're not going to be able to, to feel comfortable getting out uh, if we don't have the sensors with us. It's going to be a bit like the cell phone probably. And uh, maybe Scandinavia is, is ahead in this regard where the young people are already uh, wearing these this things by, by thousands, even tattoos in, on the skin. Um, but in any case, the sensors can be very different, can be watches, can be cell phones. Uh, but what I try to say here is that this is not futuristic. It's happening. I mean, this one, atrial fibrillation, got approved by the FDA. This one, high blood pressure, FDA checked. This one, elderly vital risk, FDA checked. This one, urine uh, infection and, and cell phone, FDA checked. So it's happening in the last year. Um, However, I wanted to highlight today that when the British Medical Journal um, analyzed um, what was the performance of these apps, in, particularly in dermatology, it wasn't that good today. That's a reality that I have found. I'm not saying that that's, this doesn't have future. Many of you are probably working on apps and everything. And, and of course, the, the, I mean, the landscape is there. I'm just saying that in healthcare, we need proof and the proof that we saw so far, when they meta-analyzed this, wasn't wasn't that big compared to other data layers. Um, another data layer is, of course, whatever happens at the lab. So molecular biology, proteomics, all that. So pretty impressive what Google did with the same algorithms uh, that they normally use, and they published this in Nature. They were able to to advance several years in prediction of protein folding, which for clinicians doesn't really mean anything, but it means a lot in terms of drug discovery. And that's why today we already have four drugs which are being AI supported in their, in their development, which is so new. I mean, we get used to technology very fast, but just one and a half years ago, this was science fiction. It was impossible. And now it's happening. So it's, it's remarkable. And now another data layer, and, and I'm not going to go by, uh, through every data layer, so don't worry, but um, I think we, we need to highlight this one is, is genomics. Not only because it has a lot of information, 
predictability about us, but also because the price has plummeted um, to a few hundred dollars. So you don't have to be a visionary to understand that if that's the case, everyone's going to get sequenced eventually. It's a matter of time. So some countries are more ahead, some less. So the Scandinavians, again, um, and the US and Canada are also quite ahead. Singapore, Korea, in the south of Europe, it's, it's not going that fast, but maybe Genomics England is the best example in the world where they're sequencing hundreds of thousands and it will be millions of citizens. So it's happening. And again, if you're an expert, if you're in genomics, you, you may say, look, but we're sequencing many people, but we don't really know what it means. We don't know their relationships between phenotypes and genotypes. We don't, we don't know the variants. But again, that's, that's what you think if you think like a human, which probably you should do. But what I'm trying to say is that um, these systems, these machine learning systems are, at the same time, they're helping us to uncover what those genomes mean. And this is what Nature and Science published last year before Christmas as their editorial letter ending the year. Okay, we got it. We understand. It's going to be about AI also helping us discover what happens there. And that's why this is going to be much faster than we would intuitively think as, as, as experts. And, and so no surprise that JAMA and New England in spring, in, in spring 2019 said, okay, I understand. So it's black boxes, also machine learning systems fed by polymorphisms. And because we have to give it a name, we're going to call it polygenic risk scores. But it's the same again, same thing, another data layer as it could be images. And again, I'm a clinician. So if you tell me this, but you don't show me proof, it's a bit uncomfortable. But again, one and a half years ago, I wouldn't be able to show anything. But today, we already have a few remarkable cases of polygenic risk scores. So machine learning and genomics um, predicting the risk, narrowing the risk, segmenting the risk in dementia, cancer, uh, cardiovascular, and so on. So it's, it's, it's quite obvious to say that this can be applicable to to um, dermatology as well. And one data layer that I would remark to keep feeding our machine is, of course, microbiomics. So surprising what happened in 2019 and so far in 2020 with this field. Even It went even faster than NGS, than, than gen human genomics. What we have discovered has been overwhelming in terms of how these things uh, work and how they affect disease. And Again, this is very related to AI. So we're discovering these things thanks to AI. And at the same time, the things that we're discovering, we're putting them into AI black boxes. And, and it's, it's always uh, things that um, correlate somehow, like, like genomics. And um, probably you, you, with analytical thinking, you may be thinking uh, right now, um, but you're separating the data layers. But what happens if I put two or three or more together? Then my predictability is going to increase. So the theoretical answer is, is yes. And, and I think eventually at some point in the future, that's going to happen. So you put together microbiomics and genomics and environmental data and you know pollution in the air and everything together, you predict better, right? But my experience, if I have to be honest, is that these projects that are too ambitious and try to put too many data layers together, usually they don't work because it's too difficult to organize and you get lost in the bureaucracy of setting up the databases and the clusters and everything. So humble advice, start with one data layer, you choose one, whatever you like, but then you fit it, but start with one and, and get results. And um, however, I see this very first example coming from China where they are already putting together images, so fundoscopy and genome the variant call five. And they put it together and at seven years, they can give you the risk for the uh, macular degeneration, which is also um, a new case where we see two data layers merging uh, for, for the first time and so many others to come. Who will do it? Which company, which country? We don't know, we'll see. Um, now I'm going to come to the final data layer for me, which I left for the end um, of, of all the data layers because this is, um, clearly, for me, the most important one, the most relevant one. Uh, the reason why it's important is, um, first of all, because it has a lot of predictability. I mean, there are many variables there that help us predict, anticipate what is going to happen to a patient. And also because it's, it's um, readily available, generally speaking, around the, the world. And I'm talking about the clinical records here. 
So who doesn't have clinical records? Now, you may say, but I have them on paper. Well, if you have them on paper, if it's handwritten, yes, okay, that I gave it to you, it's impossible, we cannot do anything. But let's imagine that you already have them in digital, electronic medical records. And, and um, so can you take that information and put it in this machine learning system? Well, um, the answer is that it's not that easy because we have a problem, a cl very classical computing uh, computer problem, which is free text. We have a free text problem, natural language. So the fact that we don't write in a structured way, we write in a very unstructured way, as you very well know and probably practice every day. And, and to be fair, we don't have to change that as doctors because, I mean, this is a train of thoughts we're putting there. It's not something that we're going to change. And everybody that has been in front of patients knows what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, so what about if we do it the other way around? What about if we build a technology that is able to transform that free text automatically into a database so that then we can give that to the machine learning system? We would solve a huge bottleneck because so much information is, information is produced every day uh, at the hospitals around the world, right? Um, so this is what I do. I think if you get invited to, to give a talk and you only talk about what you do, that's, that's not very uh, nice. But at the same time, if you don't talk anything about your project, then, then what are you doing before, besides talking? And, and so this is what I do. This is the way I contribute with my team to machine learning and AI in healthcare. I developed a technology already five years ago, which is doing clinical natural language processing. We're transforming the text in the EMR, EMRs, of course, the identified anonymized, so full respect for compliance and privacy. But we do that so that then with that database, we can fit the predictive algorithms. And when we started doing this in 2014, it was, it was quite new. Um, almost no one was doing it. And but if you look at 2018, 2019, we see how the big academic sites in the US and China, they're already using, they're already doing the same. Where they're, they're, it's already proof that natural language processing from clinical records for describing disease of phenotyping, patient journey and so on, and also for predicting is useful. And um, far from being, um, let's say, scared by others doing the same, we're super happy because all these hospitals they can do this very well, but they can only do it with their own information. And what I have been, work, have been working on with my team for these five years is in doing this multi-centric. So across hospitals with different EMR systems and even in different languages. And so that we can do this today in German, French, English, and Spanish. And, and being ready to generate real world data at, at multi-country level Exact, extracting the information directly from the clinical notes, which is something that we wouldn't be able to do manually because the, the speed is just not enough. So I call this project the, the dream of the resident, right? Because you don't have to annotate to, to, to populate the, the Excel sheet or the, or the CRF manually anymore. And that's what we dedicate our life to. We are de developing this activity in these countries, this, the, we're growing so fast that this is already outdated. We're 120 people already, and it's very, very nice. You know, doctors and mathematicians and um, programmers all combined together working uh, and doing um, uh, studies across all specialties, ev every area. And um, in this regard, I, I invite you to, to participate from the dermatology uh, perspective, because as you see, uh, amazingly, we, we haven't started so far any project in dermatology. And I think the reason is that probably when from dermato dermatology, you think about AI and machine learning, you go directly to the images. And what I'm trying to say here is, is that images is just one data layer, but maybe we can do another data layer or even combine two of them if, if it doesn't get too complicated. So um, we're also working on, on, on COVID and and. Just to, just to mention that this is not science fiction or not proved or anything, we are already publishing extensively high impact uh, using this technology. So in, in, the, in the hardest part of the first lockdown here in the south of Europe, um, uh, only three weeks after the doctors were seeing the patients, the COVID patients, we had written these articles and they were published. And the order of magnitude of patients was 
10,000 at a time where the biggest New England we got from China was 1,000 patients. What gives you an idea, an actual idea of what true, true AI, so no, no marketing AI, but true machine, machine learning serious stuff can do in real world evidence, evidence generation and prediction with, uh, with real patients in real life today with the technology that we have today. Now, um, I, I, I'm telling a story that is coming to the end, this story by which we're some way transitioning to a new uh, kind of medicine that is, that is living that populational level to move into something more individual thanks to mathematics. And, and that's good news, but it, of course it has uh, problems and, and you know, things that uh, uh, roadblocks and everything. And, and they were described already by Gary Collins more than one year ago in The Lancet. He said, look, when we receive these papers, um, talking about predictive models, uh, with, with machines, they, sometimes they're bad. They're not high quality. And, and the answer to that is, of course. I mean, yeah, like everything, like, like everything in healthcare, medicine, in science, the majority of what we are going to receive, let's be really very, that's the story. So no surprise. I mean, there are problems that we consider um, human in the loop um, problems. That means that you build this um, algorithm in a synthetic way, but then you put them in, in clinical practice and it's not that easy. And um, so, uh, I mean, problems that are going to be all the time. Also acquisition of, of, the, of, the, of the data, I mean, so many things, right? But um, we have to consider that the only thing we can do to see if these things work once they have proved to do it theoretically is like with drugs, you put in in clinical practice. So if you look at this diabetic retinopathy case that I explained at the beginning, um, uh, when, when they put this in practice in the US, in the grocery stores, it's working quite well. I mean, it's a project that has some pitfalls, but it's, it's actually working. It's diagnosing people, it's screening people, and they are being referred to the, to the, to the doctors. But the same project, same technology applied in other countries for different problems like acquisition of the images, they were not that successful. So what I'm trying to say is that it's going to be like with drugs, like with any other technology. There's two level, real life, not and, and lab, and we will have to check. And the only way to check is, of course, clinical trials. So um, the story shouldn't be more complicated. Um, you want to know if these things work or not? Let's try them. So you put uh, in the hospital, you put um, this technology to work, and in another one, you don't put it, and then you compare, and that's the story. That's how we do things in medicine. And until we don't have these clinical trials, everything I have said doesn't count because I haven't proved that this is changing clinical healthcare. I'm just saying that it's extremely likely that it's going to happen. But with this first clinical trials are not ready today. They're ongoing right now. Um, for, uh, we have to acknowledge that the, all of them are coming from China, what gives you an idea about where this technology is moving, that they're incredibly new, that we didn't have clinical trials so far, and that this is happening now for the first time. Now, th we have some examples where we start to see proof that this is, in fact, happening. Like um, uh, these this people at uh, Duke, uh, the Duke Univers University of Duke in the, in the U.S., that um, decided to um, tackle the problem of uh, which patients should receive an EEG uh, based on the risk of seizures and which, uh, and which shouldn't. And instead of doing it manually, manually means classical statistics, SPSS, humans thinking, they gave it to a machine learning system. And the, the system said, look, this is the variables that I consider to be important. And then the neurologist uh, jumped in and said, Okay, but this one and this one, I'm not going to use them because I think the machine is failing here. So a very nice case of combination of human and machine capabilities. They decided that the score should have these ones finally. They put it in practice. Three years later, they measured, they had impacted, they had um, reduced the scissors by, and the cost by 50%, which is an actual, the first actual case that I've seen of AI in real clinical practice giving results. And that is, I think, remarkable. Now, um, I'm almost finishing, I think, with, with something else that we should all consider is, of course, ethics. And that always has to be technology. You're talking about technology, there has to be ethics so, and regulation. So um, this uh, paper from uh, at JAMA 
we received this from China a bit, a bit before the pandemic. And um, by looking at the pictures, at the photographs of these citizens, they were able to know who had an atrial fibrillation, which is very remarkable. Uh, but what I uh, um, note here is that the editor said, okay, it's very impressive, but let's be careful because today it's photographs and arrhythmia, but tomorrow it's going to be, you know, photographs and what? And psychosis or what else? Intel intelligence, intelligence of your children. So besides um, um, stopping your, uh, your, your social networks, which probably we, shall, we should all do, uh, I think this is something that we'll have to consider. Now, uh, along these years, something that I have learned is that when you get confronted with machine learning for the first time and you understand the power of it, normally as clinicians, we want to have all the answers the first day. And sometimes we get paralyzed by analysis. Um, so my humble advice here would be, would be that. Um, let's not do that. Let's isolate our clinical question as if we had to do this manually. And then we call the AI people and they can build it for us. Because as the Spanish painter Picasso said, computers are useless. They can only give us answers. Now, what I don't know is if Picasso um, would have guessed that um, in 2019 at MIT in Boston, uh, a machine would be able to ingest all his paintings and generate a uh, non-previously existing, uh, but Picasso-like completely new painting like the one you have here. And by sharing with you the picture of the 120 people that work with me at Savannah, transforming free text from medical records into real world evidence and predictive modeling. I want to leave you because some, somehow they have taken me here and, and in a way they have been with me here today speaking. So thank you very much for, for your time and attention. And I'm, I'm very happy to take questions. Dr. Medrano, not only an impressive bio, very impressive talk. Uh, you're doing cutting edge stuff. I also want to let the audience know it is, I think, somewhere about 12.30 in uh, Spain, where you are. Uh, so exactly. is, that's called dedication. That's uh, <laughs> the kind of dedication that dermatologists have. So thank you very much for uh, being uh, with us uh, this evening. I, I know uh, Spaniards like to go uh, out to dinner late at uh, 10 o'clock, so, but you're still past that on a Friday night. You should be at a pub or something having a drink. Uh, <laughs> It's like being on call. Yes, yes, absolutely. Anyway, uh, we have time for any burning questions. Uh, otherwise, we have to move on. But again, thank you. What an impressive talk. I've heard several uh, uh, deep uh, learning uh, lectures previously. And uh, yours is, I think, by far the uh, best one that I've uh, heard. I'm beginning to understand all this. Uh, and uh, I think that it is the future. I've heard that it is the future, and I now I'm a believer because of your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.